<clears throat> oh, how nice. And thank you all um, for braving the misery and coming out tonight. Um, as always, I'm grateful for Green Space for inviting me to host a series of remarkable conversations with poets and performers and editors whose interest in the word is elevating and always instructive. Tonight, we have a very special program that's devoted to two extraordinary writers, Elizabeth Hardwick and Robert Lowell. And the occasion is the publication of The Dolphin Letters, um, the breathtaking and nearly novelistic correspondence of a breakup and reconciliation and the bonds that tie and the order that must be broken. In 1970, the poet Robert Lowell was abroad in England about to teach at Oxford when he fell in love with Caroline Blackwood, another writer of stature. As Hardwick remarked trenchantly in a Paris Review interview, Cal, and here she was using Lowell's nickname short for Caligula, I don't think Cal ever had an interest in a woman who wasn't a writer, a very odd turn on indeed. Since most women writers are not passive creatures, prone to saying, that's nice, dear, and so on. In any case, Hardwick, who was in New York with the couple's daughter, Harriet, surmised Lowell to be in one of his quote-unquote manias, and that's where our story begins. Excerpts from Hardwick's letters will be read by the great American actress Kathleen Chalfont, lately of The Affair, and Dear Elizabeth, an adaptation of Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell's correspondence, along with the big new hit for quartets that was just on in London and is coming to Lincoln Center, and my conversation about the Dolphin Letters uh, to be published by Farrar, Strout, and Giroux in November is with Saskia Hamilton, the brilliant Barnard professor who has edited the letters of Robert Lowell and Words in the Air, the complete correspondence of, Rob of Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell. In addition, she's written several volumes of her own verse, including As for Dream, Divide These, Canal Arc, all published by Grey Wolf. So can we welcome these extraordinary ladies to talk about an extraordinary lady? Um, Kathleen and Saskia. Kathleen, I love that your chair says artist, and it's true. And it's all true. Um, I'll put this here just in case anything technical happens. You'll have something else. I brought and a load of books just in case. OK. <laughs> this is Saskia. Hello. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Um, <coughs> Well, this is a, a sort of evening that's been long um, in emotional development, in a way, um, because I was a visiting professor at Wellesley College in, oh, I'd say about five or six years ago. And uh, one night, I went to meet Frank Bedart for dinner. For Frank, that's lunch. He's, he's a very nocturnal creature. And at the end of the dinner, he gave me um, an envelope, and he says, I think you should read these because you get Lizzie. Um, they've been under my bed for many years. Um, I, did, I don't know what to do with them, and perhaps you'll have a, an opinion. And so I went back to my apartment and stayed up all night reading these letters. Um, these were the original typewritten mm -hmm. notes and handwritten notes from Lizzie to Lowell, and basically the top of my head blew off because they contain some of the greatest writing um, that she's ever done, and also um, the most extraordinary understanding of other people. She was a great critic um, in part because of her enormous empathy and her, her um, I would say a kind of moral impatience <laughs> with people who didn't uh, deal with things correctly. And so um, I knew her just a tiny little bit. Um, she scared me, um, into, I mean, completely, um, because of her inability to sort of buffer 
opinion. Uh, my great friend was Barbara Epstein, who was her great friend. So that's, I'm just going to tell you about an evening. So Barbara had me for dinner, and the other <laughs> guests were Elizabeth Hardwick and Toni Morrison. <laughs> I've never, I haven't recovered since. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about this incredibly brilliant and daunting project and just the roots of it and where it's taken you. It begins... As an editor and a poet. Well, it began with um, when I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I worked, I did a little volunteer work for the Three Penny Review mm -hmm. in Berkeley, California. Mm -hmm. And the editor of the Three Penny Review, Wendy Lesser, knew mm -hmm. I was going to New York for graduate school. And she said, oh, Elizabeth Hardwick needs some assistance. Mm -hmm. And she wrote her phone number on a little, on her little card. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know who Elizabeth Hardwick was. I was, you know, so young. But I did call Elizabeth Hardwick and said that Wendy had suggested I call. And she hired me to catalog um, what was left of Lowell's papers mm -hmm. in her apartment. What and year was this movie? This was in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an extraordinary experience. Almost 20 years after his death. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it was all the really personal things. Most of his papers had already been sold. But um, she said, I don't want to die and have my daughter have to deal with all of this. Mm. Um, she really wanted to um, take care of it for mm. Harriet, and it was a little bit of a burden for her. So mm. um, I did that work for her, and there were lots of little stories. She was formidable and terrifying. I never called her Lizzie. Mm. Uh, I always yeah. called her Ms. Hardwick. Um, Do you remember how she used to answer the phone? That was even scary, too. Hello. Yes, yes. <laughs> I remember she once. I was teaching for a little while at a college in Massachusetts, and she said, "Where are you now, honey?" Yeah. <laughs> and I said, "I'm teaching at a college called Stonehill." Mm -hmm. And she said, "Sounds like a prison." <laughs> she was like, you know. She was very much like that. I remember it was the. I just had quit smoking, so I wasn't drinking because drinking and smoking went together. And she said, "Honey." Um, you're not drinking? I said, no. She said, are you an alky? <laughs> <laughs> that was fairly standard. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, she could be quite devastating and yes. very funny. Always with a laugh at the end. Yes. So, um, so that was how I Were first you cataloging in, their apart that, in, apartment? The, in that apartment? And mm. she was watching... The, um, Court TV. She well, she at that time she, it was the Justice Souter nominations yes. uh, hearings, and she would come da come downstairs every now and then and say, "Oh, it's so interesting. He lacks Proust." You know, <laughs> she was very interested in his his Proust taste. Um, so that was a job I did as a graduate student, and then and then many years later, I worked on Lowell's letters, and you know would would she would invite me over to you know I'd say. Uh, I've figured out most of the people referred to in this letter, but who's Fred and, you know, who's Phyllis or something like mm -hmm. that? She would explain it to me. Or there would be a little joke in a letter, like Lowell would say something like, I'm going to the Orkney Islands, home of the Spence negligence. Mm -hmm. And she would say, Spence negligence. And she would just <laughs> laughed and laughed and laughed. Um, and it has, has to do with James Russell Lowell's family I and see. Uh, I the see. kind of the, the, cr the wild side of the uh, genes that yes. Lowell had inherited from James Russell Lowell was called the Spence negligence. I see, I see. Um, um, and then... Um, how, so did, how, did you how did you work on the, comp the letters? Um, go from Lizzie's stash to the sort of more public To this thing. Job. Well, what happened was when I was working on, when I was cataloging the letters, I was very careful not to read them. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, it was just an instinct I had, but I didn't want to be sitting in her apartment, her paying me by the hour and snooping in you mm -hmm. know, their private lives. Um, and so I was very, very careful and um, just um, about that. But every now and then there would be a letter that was undated and I would have to just read a few sentences in the beginning to try and place it. Um, and so I would catch glimpses of 
really, um, they were mostly Lowell's letters to her mm -hmm. and Lowell's letters to Harriet. Um, there were a few other interesting items like um, a letter from the Desna Mandelstam defending mm -hmm. his M Osip Mandelstam translations uh, from Vladimir Nabokov, mm -hmm. uh, who was very savage about them, mm -hmm. um, and uh, ha careful hand corrections in pencil of her English. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful objects. Um, and um, then I went on and just had my jobs in my life. but. Elizabeth Bishop's letters were published in 1994, mm -hmm. I believe, one art. And I think a year later, there was a new biography of Lowell by Paul Mariani mm -hmm. called Lost Puritan. And I read that biography and kept running into phrases and things that I half recognized from the little snippets I'd seen. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to Frank and I said, you know, has anyone thought of doing Lowell's letters? I would love to be able to just be an assistant to whoever does that. Um, do you know anything about it? And he said, no, no, but I'll, I'll write to um, Farrah strauss Giroux about it or something. Mm -hmm. And then I got sort of worried because I didn't want Elizabeth Hardwick to hear about my inquiry uh, from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I also really wanted her to know that I had very carefully observed, you know, had not intruded on her privacy. I'd never told her that overtly. I just, that was just what I, my, my practice as it were. Yes. And I, um, I just got concerned. And so I wrote her a, a letter and I said, I just want you to know that I spoke to Frank and I said, I would love to be the assistant on, you know, whoever might, you know, I could help transcribe or something. And she called me up and she said, honey, <laughs> she said, mm -hmm. Um, it'll take a few years before, you know, Frank gets around to asking, so why don't you, I just called up Jonathan Galassi and, you know, mm -hmm. and you can have the job. And I, I'd never in a million years expected to be made the editor, but I was. And so that was a whole um, uh, extraordinary experience. Well, because you're, as a um, editor, you're working in tandem with biography all yes. the time, right? Yes. So, um, footnotes, endnotes, et cetera, are very important in terms of contextualizing um, folk. With the Dolphin Letters, one of the things that's so extraordinary are your notes and um, characterizations of, of many of the people that she mentions casually in the, in the letters. What, how did you first come upon the Dolphin Letters? So when I would go to her apartment, 15 West 67th Street, this extraordinary place, mm -hmm. um, uh, when I would show her a letter from that period, the Dolphin period, she would say, oh, this is from the Dolphin period. Hang on, here we go. She mm -hmm. would just literally physically braced herself and, you know, and then put on her glasses and said, oh, you know, this is what this is. Um, mm. I've never forgotten that. I mean, she really was um, in pain about the about those letters and Lowell, her letters to Lowell and what he did to them until until the end of her life. After she died, um, um, Frank let Evgenia Sikovitz, um, mm. Lowell's stepdaughter, Carolyn Blackwood's daughter, another great writer, in another the great writer, and beautiful <laughs> recent novel as well, mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, mm. uh, let her know that that Caroline had Caroline Blackwood had entrusted Lizzie's original letters to him um, about nine months after Lowell died. Now, the story is sorry for <laughs> this is too inside baseball. I apologize <laughs> if you're lost about like what mm. is this story. So the story is that when Lowell. Um, Wrote, wrote about his, he wrote about his life. And when he fell in love with <coughs> Carolyn Blackwood and- Evgenia's mother. Evgenia's mother, and didn't know for a while whether his new life was an arrival or a departure. Um, he wrote poems to um, help create and solve riddles for himself about his experience. And he was so struck by, so moved by, um, uh, haunted by Elizabeth Hardwick's letters to him saying, you know, how could you 
do this and leave our family and our daughter and everything else, that he began to turn her letters into sonnets because he wanted her voice represented in his po book of poems about his new love. And in the process, which was very Lowellian, he revised and changed the letters um, a lot um, in order to, you know, condense them to 14 lines. And <laughs> he is not, he's not a hero in the Me Too movement <laughs> at all. No, no, no. 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 And um, this was a, a big controversy, which perhaps we'll talk about, but when- I Let's talk about everything, it's fascinating. When Lowell um, and Hardwick eventually reconciled, um, they were always polite to one another after this period. But for the sake of Harriet. For the lot. sake of Harriet, they were. But, but they had been together for so long, and they were so close in a way, spirits, that they, they, they grew close again later, later on, um, after this crisis. And Hardwick said, I really want to have my letters back. I just want to know, she said, for history, how they went, mm -hmm. you know, because I know you changed them. And part of the, what was so disconcerting for her about reading those poems that were meant to be in her voice was that she both did and didn't recognize her own voice. And of course, she was an incredible writer. And that's the, and that's the, the, the moral insult to a great writer is to the only thing you have really is your voice. Yes. And I think that um, one of the things that happens as you read along is that you see how much she did for him um, the beginning of the book, she's trying to arrange for a university to buy his papers, um, and she keeps getting better prices for him, and he's not answering. Um, he's in England and falling in love with Caroline. And so the first letter I'd love Kathleen to read um, tonight is his not answering and her fearing the worst is true. Thank you, Kathleen. Dear Cal, I have no idea where you are, but I will just send this off to Faber, and if it doesn't reach you, it doesn't matter too much. I got your cable when I came home after a weekend. When I saw it lying there on the floor, I knew what it would say. I must say, I feel rather like a widow. Your things, you, your life, your family, your clothes, your work, your old shoes, ties, winter coats, books, everything seems sitting about at every turn. Thinking you were coming back, I had your typewriter overhauled and took it up to your study for you, and it was just as if you were there. All your little objects, papers, books, your desk, just as you left it, your bed, I suppose just as you left it isn't accurate since it's a lot cleaner. <laughs> Waiting to be dirtied creatively. And I was spraying mothballs on your clothes and looking about our living room, your family, your past everywhere. I feel you've totally forgotten us with an amnesia, but we have not forgotten you. I'm sending this review by Kathy Spivak, very sweet if not interesting. <laughs> I sit here answering your mail, saying, my husband is away and will be so indefinitely. I do not think he would like to write on his concept of style, since this isn't exactly what he likes to do, but I will send along your kind letter. And so it goes. Anthologies pile up, telephones ring. I don't know why I'm writing this. There are so many absolutely pressing practical problems with Harriet and me. I've written them all to you, I think, and have no answer or even mention of them, and so I suppose it would just be vexing to go into it all. And these are, of course, worrying, but not my real grief and anxiety. Soon after the man was here from Harvard, I wrote that I thought their offer would be agreeable to you, but you would get in touch with them when you came back. I haven't written Stony Brook, but I guess I will. I cannot proceed on my own with Harvard, and they would not like it, nor can it be done in a casual way. The restrictions would need to be quite specific and thought out, for your own ease, I think. Also the material, ah, oh, 
is very interesting and you will want to see it to know what you want to have copied and so you will certainly need to come back here one of these days. Strange old manuscripts you will be interested in. The end of Dalton was somehow just a catastrophe for our beautiful girl. She was so happy to say goodbye to it and to feel something new and hopeful ahead of her. If it is ahead of her, I've had to raise her and so I couldn't come to England with you as I so wanted to and share all of that and perhaps you would have kept your love for us if we hadn't been separated. I will do the best I can. This is just to send undying love to you, a great sense of loss from me and from your daughter, Elizabeth. Mm. Thank you, Kathleen. Well, that's just the beginning. So, yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you, Saskia, about the other person in this um, story, Elizabeth, and her background and where she had come from, and um, what was it about her as a writer that made her ex so extraordinary? She came from a very modest background in Lexington, Kentucky. Her father sold um, appliances, That's I believe, right. mm -hmm. and she was able to go to, she went to the University of Kentucky and then came up to Columbia. Um, and I asked her what she had studied in graduate so school, and she said, ever trendy, Milton. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Um, but sh I asked her why she didn't pursue a PhD, and she said um, at that time in 1940, um, right after the war, I believe. Right before the war. Right, th right before the war, pardon me. Um, you could not, as a woman, get a job as a professor, and that's how she started writing, was to have the freedom, but also to have some access to money um, through her mind. Um, so, tell us what you know more about her development. Um, we can do this together, I think, because okay. you writ wrote that um, beautiful and completely accurate uh, portrait of her in The New Yorker in 1998, I think it was, yes. Singular Woman. May, may I t tell about the process a Please. little bit? Please. <clears throat> I got there, I was so nervous. I've only been nervous twice. One was Lizzie, and the other one was um, a great art director named, um, she was married to Peter Bogdanovich, Polly Platt. And so I showed up at Lizzie's house, and she opened the door wide, and she said, Mrs. Howells is mean boy coming to see me. <laughs> and I said, and she noticed that I had, was so startled and scared, and she said, you just sit down, honey. And she gave me some water and she said, and I started to ask her questions and she said, I think, um, I know exactly how this is going to work. You write me the questions and I'll write. Mm. And it was a collaboration. And the question, of course, that was the most difficult was Lowell. And she cut through my politeness and she said, and I'll never get over it on the page, she said, as for having a crazy husband, <laughs> And that was the first line. Um, so, so um, that's wonderful. She fell. And she fell in love with him at Yaddo. Mrs. Yes. She. So she spent the forties in New York, um, back and forth between Kentucky and New York, but then really in New York, um, living in a kind of what you call a, is right a mariage blanc yes. with um, a friend from Kentucky who um, was obsessed with. Uh, press agent for Billie Holiday. He became a press agent for Billie Holiday. He was obsessed with jazz, and, yes. and she was too, and they would go around. And, um, and then um, in 1949, she went to Yaddo. Mm -hmm. um, and, or, no, I'm sorry, in 1948, anyway, mm -hmm. I think it was in 1948, she went to a conference at Bard College, and Lowell was there. Mm -hmm. And um, Lowell, there was some terrible punch that was made of, you know, rye or gin of some kind that was just deadly. And um, it was very sweet, so people were, were, didn't suspect how powerful it was, and Lowell drank too much, and he passed out. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth Bishop tells a story that she was with Elizabeth Hardwick, who saw him passed out on the, on the ground, and said, 
why he's an Adonis. <laughs> 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 and uh, and Daryl Pinckney has mm-hmm. wonderful stories about how she was so attracted to him. That, that she, she threw up. That she threw up. Yeah. Was, or she would hide herself. She'd see him coming down the street and she would hide around the corner. Um, but then in early 1949, in January, she went to Yaddo, uh, mm. where Lowell was um, had been for a few months, and um, just to do a sort of writer's retreat. And they hit it off hugely. But it was also um, a time when Lowell, who had been isolated for a while and drinking too much, um, began to get very concerned about a um, Soviet agent who had been living at Yaddo and mm-hmm. had been, been supported by the director of Yaddo. There was some story in the paper. And he got um, kind of crazily obsessed about this Soviet spy and got the whole literary world to kind of weigh in on whether the director of Yaddo should be fired or retained because she had harbored this spy. Um, and what was really happening was that he was having his first uh, manic, real true manic episode, a first severe manic episode. Um, but no one knew it at the time. He was very, very charming and very lively and uh, very compelling company. And so uh, Lizzie was sort of part of that um, thing that was happening. And then there was a sort of what Lowell later called an explosion, which was just an absolutely psychotic breakdown. Mm. And um, he had to be hospitalized and he was put into, a, it was a sort of, you know, cliche of padded cell, mm. straight jacket, shock treatments. Um, there wasn't much treatment in 1949 for severe mania <laughs> except for that. Um, and he was in, in uh, the hospital in Yaddo from March until July. She, and she stayed by his side. And she stayed by his side. And um, in early July, he he said, will you marry me? And so they got married, um, I think it was the day before or the day after her birthday. I can't mm-hmm. remember which one it is. Um, and she, you know, she had an instinct, I think, from the very beginning that who he was when he was ill was very different from who he was when he was well. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't have a kind of blurred sense that he was this crazy person. Um, manic depressive illness is an episodic disease um, that wasn't very well understood at the time, not that it's that much better yeah. understood now. And part of the, part of his mania was to fall in love with other women, um, some of whom he would always denounce Lizzie and say, I'm going to marry X person, and she would know that um, there, would, there was an onset of um, mania about to happen. And I always wondered, she never refers to it in her wonderful book, which I recommend, Sleepless Nights, um, where she talks about the marriage obliquely, but she never met, she never talks specifically about um, this aspect of her life with him, which was uh, a lot of caretaking. Um, he had been married to Jean Stafford. Before that, they had been in a terrible car wreck, and then he hit her and broke her nose again, and she wrote an incredible story that I think every woman in the world should read called The Interior Castle. Um, and then, was he married to someone else after? No. It was just uh, Lizzie, Lizzie after just that. Lizzie after that. And um, when Jean Stafford heard that Lizzie had married him, she said, what a greedy girl. Um, she didn't blame him, she blamed she the other women. <laughs> and I think it was a situation that he would set up with other women to yes. be. Competing, so I wondered what Lizzie was made of to have that great resilience and fortitude. What do you think from your research? What I don't know personally, um, but I. She I mean, as, wrote, a, as a reader, she wrote as a, an extraordinary letter to Lowell's biographer Ian Hamilton when she described what. It was like um, that. It was there were these recurring, recurring and humiliating situations for her. Um, but that she said his life was like a terrible two-engine machine. One, I can't remember the quote exactly. One, one moving towards disaster and one moving towards health. And um, she would describe what he would be like when he was recovered from his manic episodes. And she said it was as if, as if his old self had been stored in a serene, safe box somewhere. Mm. Um, and all his old gifts of person and of art came out again. Um, he was always 
tremendously humiliated by his episodes and the chaos that 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 he created while he was um, manic, um, and I think she was just tremendously moved by him as a character mm. um, and as a mind. I think that she said that that his presence was always the most original moment imaginable. Um, so um, I think I think that was probably a combination of of really ahead of her time understanding mm. something about the illness being a physical illness, not um, a kind of revealing of his true character or something like that, like in Mania Veritas mm. or something. I think she she understood that it was a disease, um, that he was not well, and she, I don't know. She, I think that there was something from what I understood um, during our interactions, um, it was clear to me that she was really sort of taken uh, in almost, well, it was a, his mind was a kind of romance to her. Um, it wasn't anything that she could predict. And as in any sort of romance, um, there's a great deal of feeling that is uncontrollable. And I think for someone like Lizzie who was so controlled on the page in life, it might have been very interesting not to know um, in certain ways. Um, the Ian Hamilton biography that you recommend, I, I'll never forget this sort of heartbreaking moment where he falls in love with an Italian girl and it's over and she keeps getting the bills from hotels and she says, and I received the bill and I paid the bill. And so for someone who was so strong in their personality and so forthright in their writing, it's, I think it's the mystery of the mind, but also a kind of romance that can happen yes. um, when you're taken with someone's intellection. I wanted Kathleen to read the second letter, um, which is in process of breaking up. Um, the first letter was about being left, and now we're talking about breaking apart. Thank you, Kathleen. Dear Cal, I'm still here in New York until Harriet leaves in the morning. I got a copy of the letter Mr. Dennis of the Houghton Library sent to your agent or lawyer with his offer, etc. Now that I have managed to do all this for you, I find, as I want to say quite frankly, that I am very disturbed. I have from the first acted as a very efficient agent and a course as someone who knows the value and meaning of all that is concerned. A lot of the stuff in the inventory is mine, not just your letters to me, which I don't want to sell, but letters to me from everyone, your parents, hundreds from Cousin Harriet, from our mutual friends. I only plan, I guess, to take out your letters to me. Also, I do not think I can make you a present of the copy of Land of Unlikeness with my maiden name in it, which I bought before I met you. I plan to give it that to Harriet instead. I really don't know how to put into words all the strange feelings I suddenly have. It was I who set the Stony Brook price at $125,000 and who called Harvard and told them to bid on their own, etc. That, and for so many other things, I have never even been thanked It worries me that I should have, at this late date, taken on so much for you. You and Carolyn have treated Harriet and me with unremitting meanness. But then what else has she to do with herself? She drifts about, has babies, destroys lives of both men and women who are really serious and deep by her carelessness and spoiled indifference to consequence and the feelings of others. However, with you, it's a different matter. You have been a person of the deepest moral yearnings, and it was that person I loved. I hate your life and what you have done to those who cared so deeply for you. But that, I feel, is just the beginning of your suffering and decline. You will not be allowed to survive, but will be sacrificed to the emptiness of Carolyn, her shallow, narrow existence.
Mary has written me many times how much better off I am. Everyone insists that I am. But can it be true? I know they mean it, but I'm not sure. I enclosed the Vogue picture and article. I told them we were separated and am only sorry they mentioned you at all, but I guess I haven't been solitary in the field all the time. <laughs> I suppose this letter will enrage you, but I am enraged today by what strange little or great events, my getting all this arrangement for your papers to be profitably concluded, one can suddenly be stabbed by emotion. Well, be enraged in your turn, I don't care. I believe what I say and know it to be true. You will never be free of the thing you have killed in yourself and of your ingratitude and lack of loyalty and love. And no child you can produce can be more splendid than the one you abandoned. Lizzie. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Kathleen, we just have to make a record. You have to do it all. Thank you so much. Gorgeous, yes. just gorgeous. Um, I'm overwhelmed, Saskia, as well. Yeah. Because it's, how do you communicate loss ever in this life? Um, and she's trying to break through. She doesn't want to be this woman who's angry about another woman. She doesn't That's want right. to be the mother who's angry about the potential child somewhere else, um, and yet she can't help herself. Um, what is it, do you think, that he was trying to get away from in terms of the separation? Or was he looking toward something else, toward the future, abroad, or? I think it, um, as, uh, I'll respond as a reader. Okay. Because I didn't know um, him. I mean, that's all I have yeah, as well. Right. Um, because manic depressive illness is, is an episodic but also a progressive disease, mm -hmm. um, his manic episodes, which were very severe, psychotic, um, began to recur yearly after a certain point, particularly in the 1960s. Um, he would have them every single year. And he and lithium had not yet come to the United States. So, in 1967, he was finally prescribed lithium. It hadn't yet been approved by the FDA. Um, he was one of the early exper you know, parent, patients experimenting with the drug, and it transformed his experience of himself because he didn't think he he suddenly realized, um, you know, all the therapy I've had um, might have been as much use for a broken leg um, that that was, and he said once, I think, to Robert Giroux, all the suffering I've been through, it's terrible to think that all the suffering I've been through and all the suffering I've caused was due to the fact that I didn't have enough salt in my brain. Yes. Um, and um, I think that that was very wearing on the marriage. I think they were both very passionate people. Lowell said it was like a, a greyhound being married to a bear. <laughs> um, <laughs> And she was very thin, too. She was very thin and yes. trembled like a leaf. Yes, yeah, she did. Um, and she wouldn't hold back um, when she w had criticisms of him. And it he was, was In what I've read, he, he was often afraid of what she would say about his friends. Yes. <laughs> um, in her essays, um, there was a, at, yeah, at Yaddo at the time that, Lizzie met him. There was also Flannery O'Connor, who had a big crush on him. And um, she said, I believe to Brad Gooch in his biography of Flannery O'Connor, she said, now how did Flannery know all those things? She didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, so her love of Main Street and of, mm. of life, she said, I've never lived far from the Main Street. It's the thing that interests me the most is people out, so, out doors and stores and so on. So it was just, she, she was and wasn't um, a standard writer in that way. She liked to be reporting about the world, yes. and he liked to report about his consciousness. Yes. So 
there's, there's that friction and also that interest. If you listen to his recording, I believe, of Skunk Hour, it's her voice. Um, it sort of sounds Southern, yes. and so the, it went both ways in terms of influence. Yes, yes, and I think a lot of his um, later political um, um, sort of activism and so on, I think, was informed by her. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, he, he had a political conscience um, from very early on, but mm-hmm. I think that, that the direction it tended was, was, um, couldn't ha- but have been influenced by her. Um, I think that um, um, to the to the England question to the England question. Um, Lowell was a very big public figure in the late 1960s. There was a tremendous demand on his attention and time. Um, every anti-war movement, every, every anti-war demonstration needed to have Lowell there to read a poem, and he was on the cover of Time magazine. I think he just and felt... Miller had written Armies of the Night, and, and he was a big figure in that as well. He was a big figure in Armies of the Night. He, was, he, was, he had that kind of fame where just people want something from you all the time. And I think it was hard for him to get kind of to the quiet that he needed for his work. And he was just looking for a respite a little bit from the intensity of that life um, and the political world as well, because as much as he was interested in it and passionate about the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and others, he also was compelled to, to make his art, and those kind of interfered with each other. But also, I think that he w- he had this profound experience of not being ill um, for the first mm-hmm. time. And it's interesting, the dolphin as a choice of a title for the book of poems that he wrote about falling in love with Caroline and leaving Lizzie and Harriet, um, that the dolphin is a figure of Apollo. Um, mm. That this in the Homeric um, hymn to Apollo, some sailors are driven off course, and dolphins appear to them, and dr- and drive the ship to Delphos, mm. where they found a, found the temple to Apollo. So Apollo appears to them as dolphins, and a dolphin is also the figure, uh, the god, one of the gods of poetry, but also one of the gods of healing and of divination. Mm -hmm. And the word some scholars believe is etymologically linked to womb. So there is a there is a sense of 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 new life of being driven off course, of having his life interrupted and changed in this dramatic way by by love. Mm -hmm. And also he's searching for his art and he's searching for healing, for his sanity. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think all of these things came together um, in Caroline. In Caroline, and can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the dolphin? Because that led to him publishing three books at once. He was um, the dolphin poems. Uh, it's very painful. Kathleen and I were talking about it, and um, Kathleen is upset not only that he quotes, but he misrepresents and changes what she's written, which is what a writer has as their voice. When did he make that decision to include her work, and what was the fallout? Do you happen to have Elizabeth Bishop's letter handy? Um, yeah, well, I have a manuscript. Oh, great. A treat. Isn't that awful? I didn't even prepare her for that. <laughs> it won't be hard to find. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Very early, he was writing poems. We're here, we're having fun, come on. (laughs) Very early, he was writing poems about his experience, and then he had his first manic episode for the first time since being prescribed lithium in the summer of 1970. So at first, no one knew, including himself, whether his love for Caroline was another symptom of the illness like the other ones had been. Um, And... um, uh, he had a breakdown and was hospitalized and wrote about that experience. And Lizzie started to write him these letters. And he, um, I think it's Christopher Ricks who says somewhere that um, what, what's extraordinary about Lowell's versions of Lizzie's letters is, is that they're so powerful that they're unanswerable. Mm. And, that, and that all you can think of to say when you are compelled to answer a letter like like the ones you've been reading, for example, is to just sit down and turn it into a poem. Mm, um, mm. And so he was doing that from very early on, and he put together a manuscript in 19... in the, So 
um, in January 1972, and mm-hmm. he sent it to Elizabeth Bishop. And let me see, let me quickly find it. Mm-hmm. Um, I always get the date slightly wrong in my head. But Elizabeth Bishop had a very, very strong reaction to the book. As did a, as did a number of women who wrote to um, um, Hardwick about it, um, including old friends like Adrienne Rich, who had just lost her husband to suicide and who wrote him an extraordinary letter about going to the country house where she, that she used to share with her husband, and she was reading them, and the house suddenly was unbearable. Um, so there was a lots of support for Lizzie on this score, certainly. It's a long letter. Shall I just excerpt from it? Excerpt, please. Um, it's hell to write this, so please do. Sh- first, there's some preamble. And then she kind of eases into it, um, <laughs> first by praising him and praising the book, as, as one does with one's friends. It's hell to write this, so please first do believe, I think, Dolphin is magnificent poetry. It is also honest poetry almost. You probably know already what my reactions are. I have one tremendous but awful but. If you were any other poet I can think of, I certainly wouldn't attempt to say anything at all. I wouldn't think it was worth it. But because it is you and a great poem, I've never used the word great before that I remember, and I love you a lot, I feel I must tell you what I really think. There are several reasons for this. Some are worldly ones, and therefore secondary. And strange to say, they seem to be the ones Bill Alfred is most concerned about. We discussed it last night. But the primary reason is because I love you so much, I can't bear to have you publish something that I regret and that you might live to regret too. The worldly part of it part of it is that that it, the poem, parts of it may well be taken up and used against you by all the wrong people who are just waiting in the wings to attack you. One shouldn't consider them, perhaps, but it seems wrong to play right into their hands. Don't be alarmed. I'm not talking about the whole poem, just one aspect of it. Here is a quotation from Dear Little Hardy that I copied out years ago, long before Dolphin or even the notebooks were thought of. It's from a letter in 1911 referring to, quote, an abuse which was said to have occurred that of publishing details of a lately deceased man's life under the guise of a novel with assurances of truth scattered <clears throat> in the newspapers. Not exactly the same situation as Dolphin, but fairly close. Which should, this is Hardy again. What should certainly be protested against in cases where there is no authorization is the mixing of fact and fiction in unknown proportions. Infinite mischief would lie in that. If any statement in the dress of fiction are covertly hinted to be fact, all must be fact, and nothing else but fact for obvious reasons. The power of getting lies believed about people through that channel after they are dead by stirring in a few truths is a horror to contemplate. I'm sure my point is only too plain. Lizzie is not dead, etc., but there is a, quote, mixture of fact and fiction, and you have changed her letters. That is infinite mischief, I think. The first one, page 10, is so shocking, well, I don't know what to say. And page 47, and a few after that, one can use one's life as material, one does anyway. But these letters, aren't you violating a trust? If you were given permission, if you hadn't changed them, etc. But art just isn't worth that much. Mm -hmm. I keep remembering Hopkins' marvelous letter to Bridges about the idea of a gentleman being the highest thing ever conceived higher than a Christian even, certainly than a poet. It's not being gentle to use personal, tragic, anguished letters that way. It's cruel. Mm. Thank you. (laughs) But he did it anyway. He did it anyway. He didn't really respond to Bishop's criticism about that aspect. He and Bishop had strong artistic differences about collage and the use of material. And the use of the personal. And the use of the personal, indeed. Um, And um, he had his own ideas about Bishop being um, terrified of um, exposure. So he kind of brushed aside. As a gay woman. Yes. mm. Um, And an alcoholic, I think, as well. Mm. So he kind of brushed the, that critique aside and took up another critique she had, which was the the original Dolphin followed the plot of um, what actually happened, which was 
Lowell fell in love with Caroline. He had a manic breakdown, was hospitalized. He spent the fall in love and, and um, vacillating painfully about what he should do. He went back to New York to see Lizzie and Harriet um, and found no real answer to his dilemma there and broke up with Lizzie. Then he returned to London in January, and later that month they learned that Caroline was pregnant um, with their son um, Sheridan. And um, that was the plot of the dolphin that Elizabeth Bishop read. And she said in her letter, I think you also, the, the movement in the plot from the trip to New York to the coming of the child, which is, you know, uh, in a poem melodramatically, you know, have we fathered a bastard or something like that? I call it the burden and all sorts of things. Um, it was just too, she thought, melod melodramatic, too kind of Victorian melodramatic. Mm. And he took that up and he decided to fictionalize the poem, the big poem, The Dolphin, by changing the plot. And in the plot uh, of the book that was published, um, he moved the flight to New York section, which was the kind of encountering, confronting his life there and Lizzie and Harriet, to the very end of the book, after the birth of Sheridan, after their marriage, after his marriage mm. to Caroline, everything. And it does change the emotional valence of the poems that one reads because the poems were written in the moment mm -hmm. of anguish and vacillation and desire and thrill and all that sort of stuff, um, but were placed in a plot that don't that doesn't really support that um, mm -hmm. the, the, that kind of complexity of feeling in in some in some cases. You would have to follow, um, no matter how melodramatic it seemed, life is always cheaper and more melodramatic than what you've written. Yes. And so yes. you would just really have to follow the chronology yeah. um, in order to build a proper story. That's, um, that's one view of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of what he did. But so his, his move was to further fictionalize, as it were, the story, but he still used Lizzie's name mm -hmm. and Harriet's name and Caroline's name. And it still close, closely enough followed, you know, it was close, close enough to the true story. Um, so it didn't satisfy Bishop's objection. It didn't um, uh, satisfy many critics. Mm. Um, and certainly Lizzie found it extraordinarily painful to be written about in reviews. Um, as if these were, as as if, if this was, was what she had written. Yes, and, and she says the, the facts are not answerable as facts because, uh, because of the disguise of poetry. Mm. So... Um, this is, that's a wonderful line, and it's often something that I recommend to my students, um, nonfiction writers mostly. I said, you know, read a little bit of poetry before you start anything, because a poem is not true or false. It's what it is. And so that's what she's objecting to, is that a poem, poem is a statement of fact, emotional or otherwise. Yes. Yes. Um, how did she climb out of this? She climbed out of it by writing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, Harriet says that in many ways, she'd never remembered her mother more gay and happy. Mm -hmm. um, gay in the old-fashioned yes. sense. Yes. Um, um, more carefree and happy than during the period after the divorce. Yes. Um, she wrote these extraordinary book essays Seduction that were collected. Betrayal. Seduction and Betrayal. And then she began to write this novel mm. uh, called Sleepless Nights, which is her own reaction, I think, in part to all the problems, the artistic problems posed by the dolphin and the use of one's, one's life mm -hmm. as material. Mm -hmm. um, it is spoken from the point of view of a character named Elizabeth. Um, there are, the character Elizabeth lives in f West, on West 67th Street. Um, She's writing to Mary M. She writes to, to Dearest M. Mm -hmm. um, and it's full of letters. But the letters are invented. They're not mm -hmm. real letters. Uh, they're acts of imagination. And um, I think it's Daryl Pinckney who says wonderfully that um, her uh, lack of interest in herself was a formal problem and her um, a determination not to write about Lowell, a principle. Yes. Uh, so yes. Lowell doesn't get, I mean, he's obliquely referred to in a couple of moments in the book, but basically he is 
what Mary McCarthy called a great hole in the center of the novel. <laughs> yes. And Mary McCarthy said, I wonder what, you know, he and his vanity would have thought of being like this big missing thing in the yes. middle of her novel. Um, and it was a sort of, um, ex it was an experimental novel um, at the time, you know, mm -hmm. I think, uh, is it autofiction from mm -hmm. France hadn't yet, or was just beginning to be written then. And she was writing um, wonderful essays, very dense, essays simultaneously about the novel. Um, there's a, a great essay that to look up called A Sense of the Present, and it was um, based on reading Renata Adler's Speedboat, and that had a huge effect on these women, Barbara Epstein included. I remember Barbara saying that she was um, holding one of her kids and reading the story and the New Yorker then always put the name at the end. And she said, I just sort of couldn't believe that it was so representative of how women lived. And so this new reality in fiction was very exciting to Lizzie, Joan Didion, et cetera, um, that you didn't have to tell the story from A to B because life wasn't like that. Um, Kathleen has a, a, one more letter to read for us. Um, and this is when um, Lizzie is starting to become herself. <clears throat> Dearest Cal, I see you are now addressing me as Elizabeth Hardwick. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and forth as a commuter. Lowell to all the old trades, elevators, Castine, Harriet's friends as her mother, some of mine, and then the Hardwick train of profession, women, students, readers. Neither seems quite to belong to me, and alas, they both have a deceptively rooted and solid sound for one so much a mutation in all stocks, all roles, to use the unmentionable word. About change, I didn't mean change of place, but all change. I am struck by the drastic alterations that are possible, maybe inevitable, and by the ghastly discovery that, alas, one is never too old to change. <laughs> I don't have anything quite definite in mind, and of course the vices hold on like freckles. <laughs> I was a little low this summer, and now I'm again feeling insanely cheerful. I adore going up to Smith, two days only, but I am not set up for my own work there, and so I merely teach and read and see people. But ah, the library and coming home through the tallest, most comforting trees at midnight. Like you, I am only reading every journal in the world, all the late issues. I'm sure it's a waste, but what an easy delight for the tired mind. And for all my adoration, I go on Monday and return on Wednesday. Harriet is very well. Aren't morals and dangers connected, or at least habits and dangers? But she seems very grown up, and the gods are caring for her. I assume that because of her sweetness, in spite of her souring descent from Zeus and Hera. <laughs> Bill did not go to Jillian's wedding. He felt it, I'm sure. I like Pasternak's short biography, Safe Conduct, which I'm teaching. It has a moving, nostalgic tone with the old names, Professor Cohen of Marburg, and of course the account of Mayakovsky's death is lovely and right. Farewell for another letter. I'd write more, but nothing churns up. It'll be nice to see you again and be ever in good health and bright of soul. Love as ever. Lizzie. <laughs> so great. So, of course, when he um, wanted to come back to her, it was a big dilemma for her because she had her freedom um, yes. finally, and uh, um, she hadn't really made up her mind that's right. when he returned, yes? I think that's right. I think um, that's right. Let's talk about those last hours and days. Lowell and Caroline, Cal and Caroline, um, were very passionately in love, but um, not good for one another in some ways. Um, mm. Lowell's mania returned um, in 1975. And she was um, very frightened of it. Caroline. And she was very frightened of it. And he was frightening when he was ill. I mean, she had every reason to be frightened. 
He's um, a very big man. He's a very big man physically. Mm. Um, and um, it exacerbated her depressions. And um, so she ended the marriage, um, and Lowell accepted it. And then she changed her mind and thought, well, maybe we should be together again. There was sort of a lot of back and forth between Cal and Caroline. And then at a certain point, he started coming down to New York during this period. He was quite heartbroken. Uh, he was still in love with Caroline, but knew, um, he said, it's, it's, it's the nightmare we all have where every motion of hand or foot uh, stirs the agitation it hopes to calm. Um, and Lizzie let him come back to their apartment um, on 67th Street. And then they went to uh, Russia together and visited Pasternak's grave. Mm -hmm. Um, and they uh, spent the summer in Castine, Maine, where they used to summer um, back when they were married. And then Lowell um, uh, was going to teach at Harvard starting in September, around the middle of September. He flew to see Caroline on the 1st of September. He wanted to see Caroline and Sheridan and to, again, go over this agonizing, you know, decision whether to uh, break up or stay together. And um, he phoned up Lizzie um, and said, it's sheer torture. I'm coming home early. He was expected home on, I think, the 5th to 15th, and he flew home on September 12th. Lizzie spent that afternoon at Barnard. She was teaching at Barnard College. Mm -hmm. And her daughter, who was a senior at Barnard, said, what's going on between you two? Like, and she said to Harriet, you know, everything I have is his. You know, you and the apartment and all this. And he needs some care. He, she thought he was worthy of care. Mm -hmm. She went home and um, uh, the elevator man, speak of Miss Hard, Miss, uh, Mrs. Lowell to the hard elevator, mm -hmm. um, said Mr. Lowell's taxi's here but he's asleep. And he went downstairs, she went downstairs and got into the taxi next to him and they drove to Roosevelt Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Um, he had died in the taxi returning to her from JFK. Um, uh, but he was holding in his arms a portrait of Caroline that had been painted by her first husband who was Lucian Freud. Um, <laughs> he had arranged to buy this portrait and he was carrying it back. So it was a very complicated gesture, yeah. to say the least. <laughs> he was returning to Lizzie, but anyway. Um, and um, there are some heartbreaking details about that story. Yeah. For example, Daryl told me the story that she wanted to call Harriet with the news, mm -hmm. um, but she didn't have any change for the payphone. Mm -hmm. And she, no one would lend her a dime. She paid somebody $10 for a dime mm -hmm. to call Harriet with the news. Um, she was the witness to his death certificate, and mm -hmm. she listed herself as Elizabeth Lowell, a friend, mm -hmm. and she listed Caroline Blackwood as his wife. Very moving kind of decorum yes, that, she, that she observed at that moment. And it, was, um, it should be noted that because Caroline was the official widow, um, that when they, Caroline came to America, um, Lizzie hosted her. Yes. She stayed there for 10 days. She took care, of her, took care 10 days. of her for 10 days. Um, and Elizabeth Bishop as well. And Bishop as well, yes. Um, so one of the great things that I think is important about this book is that <clears throat> real life makes... <clears throat> makes heroes and heroines of us all if we can survive it. And I think um, that for folks who have to deal with fracture constantly, um, they get extra points for living in a certain way. And I think that the importance of this book is not only the literary value of the poems, but certainly the emergence of a great American writer, um, a woman who didn't get her due right. um, during her lifetime. And these letters will not only help you understand Elizabeth Hardwick's writing, but point you in the direction of all the great things that she did and that she left behind. So this evening has been a complete inspiration 
for me. Um, I loved her as a writer. I've learned tremendous amounts about her, about writing from her, um, and which includes criticism that is fortified by empathy and also um, persistence of vision. Um, one of the great experiences of my life was receiving a letter from her after I'd reviewed Daryl's first novel in The Nation, and she said that I've liked your comments very much, but such scrupulosity must end. <laughs> um, because she was talking to herself. Um, she was the most scrupulous of, of writers. Um, and so I owe you a great de debt, Zaskia, for making this book happen, and Kathleen for making her live. Yes. So she would have been on the floor yes. um, to listen to you read tonight. And, uh, and thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for what you've done for this year. I'm sorry, I don't know when the, the next event is in June. Um, and please come, it's Carolyn Forche. It's the final one, I'll miss you all. It's Carolyn Forche and Natalie Diaz. So please come back. And it's June something, just go on the web thing. And that okay. will be a great event. Yes, that will yes. Be a great event. Thank you again. Thank you.